Twilight by Tuesday Love Sang Rampa Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. Chapter 7 Buttercup has just been reminding me that I'm not doing much towards answering psychic questions so far in this book. I don't know what I am supposed to have been doing then because I thought that that was what the book was all about. Anyway, how about this for a question? How would a person know if the Kundalini had begun to rise other than by having his aura observed? The person would know and if the kundalini had risen through the result of wrong practices, the psychiatrist would know, too. If a person meddles with the kundalini, and he can, then he can induce very severe mental disturbance. A person should never try to raise the kundalini, but should always wait for it to occur naturally. It's a very dangerous thing indeed to interfere with the kundalini. Of course, one can observe the aura and see what is happening to the aura and to the kundalini. But then we come back to the old problem of how to part people from their panties. It is a most extraordinary thing because as I write this in an extremely hot temperature of 90 degrees, there are people out there in their swimming pools or paddling pools or whatever they call those things, and some of them are barely clad. It seems that they will take off most of their clothes for the sake of display, but when it comes to a serious thing like studying the aura, no, they would like to have clothes painted on. Anyway, by what I have seen of people around in nearby bathing pools, it's a darn good thing some of these women do keep their clothes on. They would look better in a completely shapeless garment than they do in their bikini things, or whatever they call them. It reminds me of fat women with tight pants. Oh, but it better not get on that subject. Another question. Is it possible in the present age to have the third eye opened in the manner in which you did, or must this be a result of gradual awakening of the chakras? Well, would you have your appendix removed by an amateur, or would you do it yourself? If you've got any sense, and you must have, or you wouldn't be reading this book, you would try to get the best specialist you could to do the job for you. In the same way, you would need to get a real specialist to open your third eye, and they are about as rare as raspberries on gooseberry bushes in the West. Actually, it is not at all a difficult matter if one can look at the aura at the same time, because by looking at the aura, one can tell precisely what is happening, and so it is possible to control everything. Actually, though, I would never, never advise a Western person to have the third eye opened by operation. In the same way, I advise Western people not to have acupuncture. It works just fine for Easterners because they've been brought up to it and because in many ways they are quite a lot different from Westerners. So, don't have your third eye open by operation or you may end up spiritually blind. Someone here is interested in pendulums. 
Oh, it's our friend, Sheila McMoran. She writes, Would it be possible, or likely, for an elemental or some such, to control the responses of a pendulum? Yes, it is quite possible for mischievous entities to do almost anything. They could easily control the pendulum, for instance. In case you wonder how this can be, let me say that a man is driving a school bus. Now he's got a rowdy lot of school lads with him, and after a time they might whisper together and gang up on the driver. Then one schoolboy, more foolish or more adventurous than the others, would take hold of the steering wheel and try to control it in spite of the driver's efforts. It might even be that some of the other boys would even pull the driver's hands from the wheel. Kids nowadays will do just about everything, so why shouldn't they do that? But that's a similar state to when a mischievous entity takes over the control of the pendulum. The user of the pendulum, for some reason, has lost control or never had it. And that is why I always stress that you should make the pendulum yours and no one else's, because if you control the pendulum, no other entity can possibly do so. So it all depends on how much control you have. Now, here's a question. In chapters of life, you made predictions about events which will occur during this end period of the present world cycle. During this period, do you think the gardeners of the earth will return to weed and prune this tangled, twisted garden? Or is it more likely they will return after the cataclysms have taken care of most of us weeds? Or is it we weeds? It is my belief that the gardeners of the earth are getting heartily sick of conditions on this world because, you know, humans basically are getting more and more selfish. And instead of people trying to do each other a good turn, they nowadays seem bent for destruction. I believe that around about, and I said round about, the year 2000, we may see quite startling incidents during which, possibly, the gardeners of the earth or their special messengers will come to take a look at our world. In past cataclysms, the surface people of the earth were driven so they could enter the interior of the earth through the large holes at the poles. Naturally, people inside the earth will be quite safe from atom bombs which devastate the exterior because I believe that the thickness of the earth between this and the inner layer is 800 to about a thousand miles, much of it iron ore and various hard rocks. If you want to see the fun, then hang around until around the year 2000, and then you'll get a free fireworks display. Now, for a complete change of theme, this is a question from a South American country, and the question is a very sensible one. It is, when praying, what should I really call my over-self? I do not like a human name. Would it be all right to say God, Lord, or Guide, or just over-self? You have mentioned that the over-self has several puppets to manage. Does that mean he manages other people as well, and not only me? Then it is not only my over-self, but also other people's? Are these people 
in any way related to me or not. Well, that's a stunner. I started out thinking that was one question, but instead it's a whole bunch of questions, isn't it? Never mind, let's get on with it. It really does not matter what you call your overself any more than it matters what you call your subconscious, because so long as you get over the idea that you are addressing the overself or you are addressing the subconscious, then you could even have a number. Number one for overself, number two for subconscious. Of course, that is not necessarily too facetious because it just doesn't matter what you call the overself, provided that you are consistent. You must always use the same name. Now, I've mentioned many times about the overself and the puppets. Let's put it this way. You have your body. Let's call your body the over-self. And then you have a right hand, a left hand, a right foot, and a left foot. Let's call them your puppets. So your hands and feet are definitely part of you, aren't they? They're definitely related to each other. So, in precisely the same way, the other people who are the puppets of that one over-self are related they are connected, are dependent upon each other. And the over-self has to manage each of those puppets in the same way that you have to manage your hands and your feet. For example, if your feet can't get on together, you can't walk, because supposing the puppet, which you called your feet, disliked each other and both tried to take a right step at the same time. Well, you'd fall over backwards. I'm not sure if it couldn't be done, and I'm certainly not going to try, but you have to keep your hands and your feet on a good working relationship with each other. Now, this question. When leaving this life, must we all pass the place where those elementals, thought forms, or whatever they are, try to scare us? Is that something inevitable for all of us, or do the helpers have a chance to save us from that? If we should die suddenly, for example, by some traffic accident or airplane crash, etc., do the helpers have time to get to us at once, or must we then drift alone, pray to those awful elementals? Say, I seem to have fallen on a bunch of multiple questions. Now what have I done to deserve this? Well, anyway, suppose you're going to travel by train or car, bus or plane, then you have to cross a certain area of public domain before you get into your vehicle. For instance, suppose you have a car outside your house and you want to get in that car. You have to get out of your house. You have to cross the sidewalk to get into your vehicle. In the same way, when you leave your body, you have to cross an area of public domain for spirits to get into the astral. But in 99% of the cases, you do not see any elementals. If you're not afraid, then you've nothing to worry about, because if you are not afraid, then the elementals can't bother you. They can't approach you. So what is there to worry about anyway? You might be leaving your house and proceeding to your car, and you might see a lot of gaping children at the sidewalk, but you don't have to bother about them, do you? So why bother about elementals? 
And yes, most certainly, helpers have a chance to save you from anything. It doesn't matter if you have a sudden crash, the helpers are still there. Because you must remember that time on Earth is a purely artificial thing, and it has no meaning elsewhere. For instance, if you wanted to go from, say, South America to Australia while on the Earth, you would have quite a commotion getting tickets, packing up your things, and actually traveling from South America to Australia. You would have all sorts of customs and immigration formalities. But in this other state, in the astral, you think of a place and you're there. It's as quick as that. So that a person in the astral can be an uncountable distance from you in miles, but he could say, Oh my goodness, there's Jim Bugsbottom about to have an accident. I'm going. And then the astral helper would be there at the scene of the accident, even before the thing happened. Now, for another question about astrals. You have mentioned at least two different astral stages in former books, one a little higher than the other, as far as I've understood. Do we all, average, not-so-evolved people, have to go there after dying to Earth? Is it on that plane there can exist a sort of family life you've also mentioned in some of the books? Is it possible to graduate directly from one plane to a higher one? Or must we all inevitably reincarnate between each higher astral plane? If you could look in on me now, you would see that I was looking gloomier and gloomier. For one thing, the temperature is getting hotter and hotter. It really is a hot day here. And for another thing, here is another of these darn multiple questions. I feel that I'm writing three or four books at once. We on Earth are in a certain stage of evolution. Here we are in a physical stage in a third dimensional world. When we die, that is, when our body ceases to function for some reason, we go to the astral plane, that is a sort of reception area, and in that particular astral plane, we make an assessment of what we've done and what we've left undone upon the third dimensional world. We take advice from special counselors, and perhaps we may decide that it would be better if we return to Earth, that is, reincarnate and have another life on Earth. It may be, though, that we haven't done so badly after all, and in that case, we shall be able to advance, to go to a higher plane of existence, perhaps a fourth dimensional world, perhaps a fifth dimensional world, but I must again express that time is different when one is off the earth, and one can stay a long time in the astral, and then reincarnate almost instantly according to earth days on this world. It is very confusing if you are too accustomed to believing that time is a hard and fast 60 seconds to the minute, 60 minutes to the hour, 24 hours to the day, etc. Time in the astral is flexible, but in the astral we can have our friendly associations. In fact, we have to have them in order to round out our basic experiences. We can also have suitable love affairs. I'm sure that will cheer up a lot of you. 
It really seems that some poor fellow is all gummed up about this astral business. Look at this for a question. If one of my children, or any loved one, should leave this earth before me or after me, and that person is then sent back to earth in a new incarnation before I arrive there, or I am sent back before they arrive, how is it possible for us then to meet in the astral and if they or I should have graduated to a higher astral plane, how can we then meet? Is it possible to visit one another even being on separate astral planes? Throughout my books, I have tried to put over the idea of astral travel. I've tried to get over to people the thought that they can, if they want, leave this body and go into the astral plane and meet people in the astral plane. It seems I have not succeeded too well, does not. So if the person who asks these questions will read my books, well the answer is there plain enough. If you want to meet a person in the astral, then you can, by telepathy, arrange such a meeting, and you can get out of your body for that purpose. If a person is in a higher plane, and he or she wants to meet you in the astral, he or she can travel downwards to your own astral plane. There is no problem at all, provided that both persons want such a meeting. I have just been looking at another question, and I wonder if I should quietly drop everything and retire to a monastery. Perhaps, in view of some of these questions, it would be more appropriate to retire to a nunnery. Anyway, you judge for yourself. Here's the question. And how would you answer it? At what stage exactly, or more or less exactly, does the spirit enter a baby to be born? There are thousands of women on this earth with that question on their mind. Some have been blindly, romantically in love, and have been led too far by the boy or man that confessed eternal true love and marriage, but couldn't dominate his passion, and so the tragedy has occurred. He still loves her, but yet cannot afford to marry her, and she must get rid of it etc. Nowadays, it is probably carelessness and just indulging in sex for pleasure and not caring for anything. I don't know. But can you answer that question, do you know? Sex is not sin nor bad if connected with love, as you yourself have said in the books. Sex without love is meaningless and just animal pleasure, but is still practiced mostly so. Is it not murder to abort before the spirit enters the embryo of a child? When is the moment when an abortion becomes murder? Well, well, and well again. After being exposed to some of these questions, I feel like one of those Aunt Fannies who write into certain newspapers purporting to answer all assorted manner of questions. Poor souls, I know exactly how they feel. But I feel that I am being put upon to answer questions which are not connected with metaphysics. I will give my own opinion, though, and it is this. If people 
want to know about birth control, abortion, etc., then why not go to a family planning clinic and get all the information free, and perhaps a free sample of something which will gum up the works for the desired time. You'd find it much better to go to a family counselor or some clinic or to a doctor so that you can discuss your own case and all its ramifications and all and every bit of detail about it. Then you will get information which is applicable to you and all your circumstances. But I can't see, really, that people need to have abortions nowadays when they have so many alleged safeguards available. If they're in any doubt, well, don't. Further, the entity who is going to take over the body does not take over at any specific time. It depends on the degree of evolution. It depends on the need, on the type, and all that sort of thing. So you could say one abortion could take place at a month and another at six months. Every case depends upon its own individual circumstances. And our estimable publisher will throw a fit, and he might even blush if I go into any more details. So I suggest that if you do want details, go to a doctor or a family planning clinic, and they'll tell you all you need to know. The temperature is getting hotter as the day wears on. I suppose it's almost a case that eggs in a shop window are becoming hard-boiled. Certainly, I need to be hard-boiled to face up to some of these questions. And I'm wondering whether the temperature of over 90 or the questions are the hottest. Get ready for the next one. Divorce. If two people who have been in love and married and truly have believed that they would never part in this life nor in the next, little by little get hurt by each other, bewildered and desperate, and all of a sudden realize that they cannot understand each other any more, but seem to develop into two strangers who are unable to communicate, what shall they do? Shall they go on living together, but almost starting to hate each other, and the cleft being greater and greater, and the atmosphere in the home become heavier and heavier? Or shall they separate and at least not live together, hating each other? How can this happen, when both could swear from the bottom of their hearts that they would never stop loving each other? Each of them feels that the other one has changed horribly by some mysterious fate. He and she doesn't think as before. They don't react as before. He or she are only criticizing all the time where they before saw no fault. And when also physical problems enter into the picture, and there seems to be no way out. What to do? Is it bad to separate? Should they go on living together just because they signed some documents and some priest told them to? Or should they be honest and split up and let time cure the wounds and at last, at least, be able to forgive and understand that both erred, not only one of the parts, what is wrong and what is right. Many people ask me this, so I will give my own honest opinion about it. I believe that in the Christian belief the priests meddle so much in marriage that everything in marriage is distorted. 
For example, in the Catholic belief, if a woman doesn't have enough children, the priests get thoroughly unpleasant about it and threaten the husband and wife with all sorts of horrible things. I know that is true because I've seen it happen myself. And in Ireland, I have learned the meaning of the old statement, the priest had his hat on the doorknob so the husband stayed out. If two business partners cannot get on together, then they part. It's the only sensible thing to do. And marriage nowadays really is a business. My personal opinion is that people should never separate. They should divorce and part definitely, deliberately, and irrevocably. After all, if you have an aching tooth, you don't go to a dentist and have it half pulled, do you? You have the thing yanked straight out so that you can forget all about it. Well, if you've got wife trouble or husband trouble and you can't seem to make any sense of it, then don't waste any more time. Get divorced. Never mind what the stupid clod of a priest says. He's not going through it. He's not suffering. You are. I believe most of the religious muck which is blotted out nowadays is truly wrong. In the days before Christian marriage was a most pleasant thing, different altogether to what it is now, and in religious communities not dominated by Christianity. Again, marriage is a more compatible affair. The answer then is divorce in a hurry. But try to part as friends who have had a difference, a disagreement. You don't have to go running around ruining each other's character. It takes two people to make a divorce, which means you are both to blame. Tomorrow, Mr. John Biggrass, Biggs, and his two cats, Mr. Wayfarer Biggrass and Mrs. Wayfarer Biggrass will get in their big car and roar along toward Vancouver. I certainly wish that I could go with them riding through the mountains and seeing all the trees. Here in Calgary there are not many trees. It's far different from all the green of Vancouver. But there it is. I know that my traveling days are limited, and so, first of all, I must wish Mr. Biggrass and Cats Biggrass bon voyage on their trip home to Vancouver. Biggs can look back on another vacation behind him for a year. Soon I shall be able to look back on a fifteenth book completed. I get some quite extraordinary questions. For instance, how would one answer this? I was reading in Cave of the Ancients about the Japanese monk. This made me think of myself reading different things. How is one to know if we are injuring ourselves? Now how can you answer that? probably by relating all this to medicine. Let's see what we can do. Suppose you have a television set and you look at all those advertisements about patent medicines. Or supposing you look in the newspapers and you read the advertisements about this, that, and something else which will cure everything. Well, no one in their right senses would take all the muck advertised because so many things would not be compatible. If you took two things which were opposed, 
that is, not compatible, you would aggravate your condition by adding some other condition of your own making. So I can only say that if you are reading too much on too many subjects, or too much about the same subject, then you should give it a rest. Without trying to be a super salesman, I tell people that they should read my books first, because all I say in my books is true, and I can do everything I write about. There has been a lot of so-called authors of late who have just lifted lumps out of other people's books and rephrased it so it is thought to be a different book. But if you rephrase a thing, you do not always get the same meaning, do you? So, I think that a person should concentrate on one author to one subject. And when they have read all that author has written, then, if they want to, they can go on to something else. But the way people go on is like those who mix their drinks, which I am reliably assured is a most reprehensible practice. Now, Here's another question, which really doesn't have an answer. When you move to an apartment and sense something uneasy or negative, what is it, and how can you rid the place of it? I can only assume that the question means, what can one do if one goes to an apartment which is haunted, or which is saturated with the negative influences of the former tenants. If the place is haunted, what of it? The haunter can't hurt the hauntee, and if one exerts a definite telepathic command, the haunter will go away. You see, most times a haunted building is haunted only by the dynamic vital force of a person who has passed on. The force lingers around like the last echoes of a brass band. The echoes of a brass band die away in seconds, and the echoes of a virile person's death dissipate in a second or so of astral time, which may be a hundred years of earth time, but it can be dissipated if you give a definite telepathic command for the haunter to cease haunting. We seem to have stumbled on a bunch this time. Look at this one. I know someone who was into witchcraft. He soon began to feel that demons were after him, so he dropped witchcraft quickly. Could you explain these demons, and how does one become possessed? If people mess about with witchcraft, they deserve all they get, and I have no sympathy with them, because witchcraft is definitely tampering with forbidden forces. In the lower astral, there are all sorts of entities who are like mischievous monkeys. They love imitating humans. They love teasing humans, and many, many good people, people of the highest intentions, have been to seances which were not properly controlled by a trained medium. And here, these mischievous entities have relayed messages to the medium, and he or she, not knowing any better, thought they were genuine messages. Well, nothing succeeds like success, and so the more people thought that these mischievous ones were genuine, so their power grew, 
and in the end they were able to control the thoughts of the humans. They would telepathically whisper into the brain of a human that Aunt Matilda or someone else insisted that such and such a thing be done. But again, if a person is not afraid, nothing bad can happen. If you are haunted or think you are possessed, then you just have to say very, very firmly an affirmation that nothing can harm you and that the entity persecuting you will dissipate. These entities don't want to dissipate, so they go away very quickly in search of someone else who cannot banish them. So there's nothing to be frightened about except of being afraid. My father is a teacher in a junior high school and has a growing interest in your teachings. He often tells me of destructive delinquency of the kids. They're supposed to be from good families. How can these kids get out of their ruts or be helped? I thought I had dealt with that at considerable and tedious length already because I really firmly believe that there won't be any improvement in conditions until the mother stays at home and makes the home. Nowadays, children are left to wander in the streets where they fall prey to stronger companions. Stronger companions who are often most bent on destruction. And so, they contaminate the kids from good families. The only way the matter can be overcome is to revamp our society so that, once again, Motherhood is a virtue instead of an unfortunate accident. Yesterday, a girl approached my wife and I and tried very hard to sell us her Buddhism. I told her I had another path and that her sales pitch turned me off. How is one to be sure of which path to follow? Oh, that's an easy one. The real Buddhists have no missionaries. The real Buddhists never try to persuade anyone at all to become a Buddhist. You have probably fallen afoul of one of those awful cult girls who lounge about nowadays and try to get other victims who will pay dues to some imaginary Buddhist society. But let me say again that if anyone tried to get you to become a Buddhist, then he or she is not a Buddhist, because Buddhism is just a way of life, not a religion, and Buddhism has no missionaries. There are too many cults nowadays. There is a pseudo-education in which young punks of both sexes think they are the chosen messiah who should get recruits for this, that, or some other society. In connection with this, I am going to do what I rarely do. I am going to advise you to read a particular book all about secret societies, giving the origin of some of the cults who are always advertising in the papers nowadays. Cults who try to get your money for their own ends. The book is called Secret Societies, edited by Norman Mackenzie and published by Crescent Books of New York. In my opinion, this is a most excellent book, and one that I thoroughly recommend. I wish I had written it myself. Question. Wayne and I are vegans. 
We follow Professor Arnold Arendt's diet. It consists of fruit and vegetables and no animal products and nuts. I often wondered what you might have to say about it. Is it a diet that leads to freedom from disease, as the professor believes? And also, I am anxious to have people, such as yourself, get complete nutrition from barley, tea, and butter. What do you think of this diet? If I really told you what I thought, the publisher would probably fall off his chair in a dead faint, because my thoughts on such things are incendiary. I think these crackpot diets are bunk. I think they are real muck. The U.S. military forces had a long trial of people taking the ordinary everyday military diet and those crackpots who went in for vegetarianism, you know, a cabbage leaf and a handful of nuts and things like that. Well, after six months, the American authorities discovered quite definitely that the vegetarians were inferior in everything. Inferior in brain power, inferior in physique, inferior in endurance, and definitely no more healthy. On this earth, we are animals, and as we are animals, and behave like animals, we should eat that which our animal bodies demand. So if you take muck, like this stupid diet, and you find that your health is deteriorating, you have no one to blame but yourself. I have no sympathy whatever with all these crackpot, stupid diets which have never been proved to be anything but a cult. Question. I have just bought the Book of the Dead. Have you any comments? Oh, I get such a heap of people asking about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. But, quite truly, it is wholly unsuited for Western people, because it is a concept, an abstract concept, and one just cannot turn it into a concrete book of instructions. You see, Evan Wentz was a very good man indeed, but he was a strong Christian, and whatever he wrote was greatly colored by his instinctive aversion to those heathens who had beliefs so different from his own. So he always tipped the balance against the heathen. And again, you cannot translate abstract terms into concrete phrases. That's why there's so much misconception about acupuncture and about much of the teachings relating to metaphysics. I believe that any person wanting to study the Book of the Dead should first learn Sanskrit. Anita Kellaway writes to say, Could you tell us more about the aura and the device that could be made to see one's aura? That is very interesting and could be so useful if some intelligent person could use it right. I don't understand why doctors aren't begging you to make one for them. Well, I have already written quite a lot about the aura, and an aura machine could be made if one had the money and the female models who would be willing to be studied. I've already said, though, that I can get neither. Some people now believe that the Curlian system is the answer, but I think I had better mention the Curlian system 
in another chapter because, to my definite knowledge, the Curlian system of photography is just something going in the wrong direction. I know it to be an absolute waste of time. End of chapter 7